Hi everyone and welcome to Miss Estrick Biology. This video is going to be everything you need to know about topic 7, transport in plants. So this is your one stop shop for all the information that you need and if you do want all of that summarised for you in a set of thorough comprehensive revision notes that goes through key marking points, special examiner's tips as well, then click the link below and you'll be able to access this. But for now, let's get into the topic. So topic seven then, we're gonna be looking at transport in plants, starting with the structure of transport tissues. So this table here summarizes the distribution of xylem and phloem across the different parts of the plant. So looking at the distribution in stems, roots and leaves. So within the stem, the xylem tissue is located towards the center of the stem and it forms a central vascular bundle. It's surrounded by the phloem tissue and the xylem vessels are arranged in a characteristic pattern, often forming a ring or several rings within the stem. Whereas the phloem is found between the xylem, and as we said just here on the outside, and it's the outermost layer of the stem, and it forms a ring around those xylem. In the roots, the xylem tissue is typically located in the center again, forming that vascular bundle, and the xylem vessels radiate outwards, with the youngest xylem tissues towards the center and the oldest towards the outside or the periphery. The phloem is arranged in a ring surrounding that xylem and this arrangement allows for the efficient transport of sugars and other organic compounds produced in the leaves to the roots for storage. Finally then in the leaves the xylem are found in the midrib and the veins and it extends the leaf lamina and it provides structural support and it facilitates the transport of those water and mineral ions that have been absorbed by the root hair cells to the leaves. The phloem are located adjacent to the xylem in the veins and it transports organic compounds such as sugars produced during photosynthesis from the leaves to other parts of the plant. So if we have a look at the structure of phloem and xylem, here we can see the phloem tissue and it's made up of two key types of cells. We have the sieve tube element cells which are shown here in the middle and the companion cells which are on the outside or either side of the sieve tube element. The sieve tube elements were initially living with all the organelles and they are still classed as living cells but as they start to develop they then contain very few organelles and no nucleus and you also have these perforated end walls which makes it like a sieve hence the name sieve tube elements and this enables the sugars the organic substances to move up and down through the sieve tube element with little resistance from those organelles. Now, because it doesn't have organelles, though, it is reliant on the companion cells to provide ATP for the active transport of organic substances. So companion cells do have all their organelles and they have lots of mitochondria for aerobic respiration to be able to provide lots of ATP. Next, then, if we have a look at the xylem tissue, xylem vessels are composed of elongated hollow cells called vessel elements. This is actually looking through a cross section going into one of those. And in red here, this is showing you one of those hollow xylem vessels. Now, these cells are dead when they're mature and they have lignified cell walls. So there's lots of lignin in them, which makes them waterproof and really tough. As you go through the tube as well, there are perforations called pits or pores. The structure of the xylem vessel elements allows for the efficient of a unidirectional flow of water and mineral from the roots to the shoots through capillary action and cohesion tension mechanisms because it essentially makes one continuous long hollow tube so water can flow through it as one continuous column of water. Next then we have a look at the transport mechanisms. So we're going to be looking at the transport of water through a plant first of all. And water enters a plant at the root hair cells, and that is by osmosis. And root hair cells are adapted to maximise osmosis by having thin walls, so there's that short diffusion distance, because osmosis is a type of diffusion. And also they have that long protruding part that creates a large surface area to maximise the absorption of water by osmosis as well. Once the water is then inside of the root hair cell, it's then going to travel to the xylem either through what we call the symplast pathway or the apoplast pathway, which we can see here in the diagram. The symplast is shown in blue and the apoplastic pathway is shown in orange. 
So the Aphroplast pathway is through the cell walls, which we can see here. The water moves through those cell walls. The water can enter the cell wall and move due to cohesive forces, meaning the water sticks together with hydrogen bonds. And it forms this continuous stream of water which moves through the cell walls towards the xylem. This pathway transports the water really quickly as there's little resistance to the water in the cell wall, so it can move through quickly. However, when it gets to the endodermis, there are a specialised layer surrounding the vascular tissue, which is known as the Casparian strip. And that's composed of hydrophobic or waterproof subering, and that forms this waterproof impermeable barrier in the cell walls. And at that point, it forces the water and all the dissolved solutes within it to enter the symplast pathway. Then if we have a look at the symplast pathway, this is when the water and the solutes cross the endodermis through the plasmodesmata, which is a gap here in the cell walls. The symplast pathway is moving through, or it's when the water is moving through the cytoplasm of the cell. So the water moves through the cytoplasm and when it gets to a cell wall, it has to pass through a plasmodesmata, which is one of these gaps. Each successive cell cytoplasm has a lower water potential than the next, and that's how the water is moving. So it moves through the cytoplasm by osmosis, and this is a slower process compared to the apoplast pathway. You need to know some adaptations that plants have linked to the idea of transpiration or reducing transpiration and reducing the water that can be lost from a plant. So plants have stomata, and stomata we're going to be looking at in more detail later on in this video. They're the tiny pores on leaves that can open and close to reduce water loss, but open to enable gases to exchange. So xerophytes are plants that have adaptations to reduce water loss because these plants are found in environments with very, very little water, or it could be water but the high salt concentration or it could be very very hot as well but traditionally we mean there's limited water. Marron grass is an example of a xerophyte and it's found at the sand dunes which despite it being next to the ocean which is water there is a limited water supply due to the fact that sand is so porous so the water runs away. And here we can see a microscope image looking at the cross section through a leaf of a xerophyte so we can see some of the adaptations that they have to reduce water loss. First of all we can see that the leaf is curled up and that curling up means that any water that does evaporate out gets trapped in this area which increases the local humidity and therefore it reduces the water potential gradient from the inside of the cells to the outside and therefore there's less transpiration. There are also these hairs which have the same advantage in that they trap the moisture in the air and that increases the local humidity therefore decreasing the water potential gradient so there's less transpiration. The sunken stomata is yet again creating that increased local humidity because it's lower down in the cell so as the water evaporates again you get this trapped humid air. On the outside here there's a thicker cuticle which helps to reduce the water loss by evaporation of the surface. And also not shown in this image, but there are longer root networks so that more water can be reached to absorb more water into the plant in the first place. So that then leads us on to what is transpiration and how does the plant transport water through the xylem? So we've looked at how the water gets into the roots, how it gets from the roots to the xylem. Now we need to see how it transports through the xylem through the rest of the plant and how it can actually leave the plant. So transpiration is the evaporation of water from the internal surfaces of the leaves and it's followed by the diffusion of water vapour through the stomata. And the stomata, as we said, is these holes in the leaves which are created by guard cells. And plants can control water loss using these guard cells. The guard cells will swell and bend when the plant has a lot of water in them. And when they swell and bend, that ends up in creating this opening which is known as the stomata. Now that enables carbon dioxide to diffuse into the leaf, but at the same time, water vapour is able to evaporate out. So the stomata open when it is light and the plant cells are turgid. You can actually measure the rate of transpiration with a piece of apparatus called a potometer as well. 
So thinking about how this water moves up the xylem then. We've just said that transpiration is evaporation through those stomata on the leaves. And as evaporation is the conversion of liquid water to water vapour, there are certain factors that are going to increase the rate of that. Temperature is one of them, because as you increase the temperature, the water molecules gain more kinetic energy, and therefore they're moving more rapidly and you're going to have more evaporation. If the surrounding area is less humid, or there's a lot of wind to carry away evaporated water molecules, then you have a steeper water potential gradient, and therefore more water is going to evaporate out. We've partly touched on this concept here as well already, but it's just pointing out the starting place of this water. So water is absorbed by osmosis via the root hair cells, um, and there's a big root network to increase the surface area to maximise osmosis. Once that water then reaches the xylem, we're going to be looking at how it transports through those hollow tubes that we talked about that make up the structure of those xylem vessels. So the water can move in one direction only through the xylem, which is typically against gravity, so going upwards, and that's due to the transpiring water from the leaves, which creates this pulling force from where the water's being lost. This is often known as transpiration or pull, or transpiration pull. Water is absorbed by the root hair cells by osmosis, and that water then moves up the xylem within the stem, or in this picture, it's up a trunk, and you get this continuous water column. And the reason for that is water molecules stick together by cohesion. So water is a polar molecule, which means you've got a slight positive charge on the hydrogen atoms and a slight negative charge on the oxygen atoms. For that reason, hydrogen bonds can form between different water molecules, and those hydrogen bonds between them all creates this cohesion, this sticking together of water molecules to create this continuous column of water. Now those water molecules can also adhere to, so stick to, the walls of the xylem, which is what this grey here is representing, the walls of the xylem. So you would also get hydrogen bonds sticking this water molecule to the walls. Now this cohesion, as we said, results in that continuous column of water, also known as the transpiration stream, in the plant stem. Tension is put on that transpiration stream, or in other words, a pulling force, when water evaporates out of the stomata. And that's because you get this negative pressure. As the water evaporates out, there's a negative pressure and that creates this tension or pulling on that continuous column of water. This movement of water out of the stomata results in the water column being pulled up the xylem towards the stomata, and that is known as the transpiration pull. This pull will draw up the water and it also puts tension on the xylem because the water is stuck to or adhering to the xylem walls. So this pulls the xylem inwards, making the hollow tubes narrower and longer. And this change in diameter of the xylem is measurable. For example, the diameter of a tree trunk will change according to its transpiration rates. And when it is a narrower tube, it makes it even easier to pull that column of water up the xylem. Next then we're going to have a look at the mass transport of organic substances in plants. So these are for example sugars such as glucose or sucrose that are made from the photosynthesis of a plant and those sugars are needed for respiration so it's important that although the sugars organic substances will be made in the leaves they can be transported up and down the phloem to any respiring cells in the plant. So this takes us back to what we were talking about in terms of the phloem tissue, which we mentioned earlier, those sieve tube elements and the companion cells, which are involved in this mass transport of the organic substances. Translocation is the term that we use to explain how organic substances are transported in a plant. And this is an active process, meaning it requires energy. So we're going to go through this mass flow or translocation from what we describe as the source, which is where these organic substances are produced, which is the leaves and photosynthesis, to the sink, which is what we call the cells which are going to be using the sugar. Now, although it says a root here in brackets, is any respiring cell. 
So we're going to look at how those organic substances are transported from the source, which is where they're made, to the sink, which is where they're used. First of all, we're going to have a look at it with this model here, this source to sink explanation. So we've got the phloem shown in grey, the xylem shown in green. We did talk about the structure that you have the xylem typically in the middle and the phloem on the outside. And we've got a tank of water here as well, just to represent this model. So we've got the source cell is the photosynthesizing cell and we've got our sink cell is the respiring cell. The photosynthesizing cell, because it's going to be creating lots of sugars, that lowers the water potential of that cell. And as a result, water can enter by osmosis. At the respiring cell, you're using up lots of organic substances and sugars. So that means there's going to be a more positive water potential or less negative, And therefore, water will leave those sink cells by osmosis. Now, this difference in whether the water is moving in or out by osmosis is going to affect the hydrostatic pressure. As water moves in at the source cell, there's an increased hydrostatic pressure. And as water is leaving at the sink cell, you have a decreased hydrostatic pressure. That then creates this pressure gradient. And as a result, the sugary solution in the source cell is going to be forced up and through the phloem towards the sink cell due to that high hydrostatic pressure in the source cell in comparison to the sink cell. So that's the concept of mass flow in terms of the pressure changes. But you also need to know how does the sucrose, which we're using as our example of the organic substance, get from the source cell into the sieve tube element in the first place. And this is where we see the role of active transport and the need for energy. So step one is we've got the photosynthesizing cell, such as your leaf cell, is going to be creating that organic substance sucrose. And that creates a high concentration of sucrose at the site of its production. And therefore, it can diffuse down its concentration gradient. That would be via facilitated diffusion, though, because it's too large to move through the plasma membrane. And it goes into the companion cell. At this point, there'll be active transport of protons or hydrogen ions from the companion cell into spaces within the cell wall. And because it's active transport, that requires energy. That creates a concentration gradient and therefore the protons move down their concentration gradient via proteins into the sieve tube elements. And that is how we get the sucrose into the sieve tube element. Co-transport of sucrose with hydrogen ions occurs via protein co-transporters to transport it into those sieve tube elements. This is now where it links to that model we were talking about. Because we've got that sucrose inside of the sieve tube element, it lowers the water potential. That means water is going to enter by osmosis. That increases the hydrostatic pressure and it forces the liquid to be moved towards the sink cells. At those sink cells, sucrose is going to be converted into glucose and used in respiration, or it might be stored as insoluble starch. More sucrose is actively transported into the sink cell which causes the water potential to decrease. This results in osmosis of water from those sieve tube elements to the sink cell. So some water also returns to the xylem as well. The removal of that water decreases the volume in the sieve tube element and therefore the hydrostatic pressure decreases. And there we have that pressure gradient then. So you've got a high hydrostatic pressure at the source compared to the sink end of the sieve tube element, and therefore the solution moves on mass. So there we have it, that is topic seven for Cambridge International A-Level, going through everything you need to know about the transport of molecules, so water and sucrose in plants. Hope you found it helpful, and if you did, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on any of my latest videos.